I, I don't I just think wish, we should have that role. I, look, I, I here. Just, my I'll only, meet you halfway. My only, I, my only, I just want to say, my only wish, I don't think there's anything wrong with telling Russia's side of the story. I wish you told Ukraine's. Because in Ukraine's story, we are unambiguously not the devil. We are the potential for salvation. And ultimately, it's their country on the brink of being invaded. They're being talked about in this conversation, a buffer state, a pawn, oh, only East Ukraine, whatever. But a lot of people live there. At the end of the day, they want us to protect them from Russia. What's going on, man? How's not, it going? Uh, not much. And also, happy birthday. I didn't I didn't realize we'd be talking about birthday. I hope I'm not taking uh, you away from anything. No, no. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And no, I uh, I did a show today like normal. And, uh, you know, we, we had planned this a little bit in advance, so I was looking forward to it. And yeah, I mean, a birthday on a Monday is not the best day for a birthday to fall. Not that I'd be doing anything special anyway. Yeah, I guess one of the benefits of, of you know, working for yourself or at least doing your own work is that uh, any day could be a Saturday uh, if you're strong true. enough to, to seize fate and do what you will. That is true. Yes, that is true. So t tell me, man. Um, I watched your original video on Ukraine and Russia, um, and then I saw that you had one on me and Hassan. I didn't watch it because I didn't want to hurt my fifis before our talk. I, uh, <laughs> I was afraid to watch that, and uh, I didn't want to come into the conversation with like 10 things in my mind where I'm like itching to get to, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, I think that's probably fair and reasonable, especially since the way in which a person expresses criticisms is definitely going to differ in reacting to something as opposed to talking to the person. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to talk to you about a few things, um, you know, not in like a hyper confrontational way or anything, but I was curious about your perspective on some issues because, um, so when, when it comes to foreign policy stuff, I feel like, especially with issues like this, the left is split perfectly down the middle between people who get accused of being pawns of the U S state department and people who get accused of being pawns of the Kremlin. And, um, <laughs> And that's just like the eternal divide on issues like this. And the contrast has been especially evident here. Um, as somebody firmly in the State Department camp uh, myself, um, and I think you get accused of, of being the Kremlin side more often, I felt like some of the perspectives you had on the situation felt um, propagandistic to me. And I was I was wondering what your rationale for some of them were. Sure. So please elaborate. What, what are the things that you had issue with? And then I'm more than happy to dive into it. So there, there were a few things that I remember specifically, but I guess I, I want to approach it uh, from, from your perspective, like the logic that you use to build into those mm -hmm. ideas, as opposed to like, well, what do you mean with this one sentence, that one sentence? With, with regards to NATO expansion, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that I and a lot of other people on the left uh, recognize that NATO is a pretty bad institution uh, for a few reasons. Um, and that NATO expansion definitely carries its problems. But I feel like there's a strong line between criticism of NATO and uh, accepting Russia's criticisms of NATO and the justifications that they derive from those criticisms. Like NATO's expansions warrant us forming a protective shell of of the husk of the USSR to prevent NATO from getting close to our borders because that's that's kind of like the the attitude that they're taking with the Ukraine situation you know uh, it, it, like if NATO expands eastward we have to protect ourselves but I feel like these are on very different levels of severity whereas NATO expansion is like a thing to be concerned about annexing neighboring countries is really really bad so. I feel like they're so in separate categories of harm that even bringing up NATO expansion in relation to what's happening in Ukraine comes off kind of like a defense, like a like like you're you're holding water for Russia's excuses, you know? Yeah, well, there are certain things that I consider like pretty obvious in the broader conversation about not just Russia, but if we're talking about Russia, China, or any uh, authoritarian government. There are things that I think are obvious that, you know, I, I may not have brought up in the segment because they're so obvious, but I'll state some of the obvious things right now. I mean, it goes without saying 
that, you know, Vladimir Putin is no leftist, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, this is a guy who uh, imprisons journalists. This is a guy who's virulently anti-gay. Russia is effectively an open oligarchy in a way that's even above and beyond how I would describe the U.S. as an oligarchy, and I would describe the U.S. as an oligarchy. So uh, Russia's really bad. The, the point in the video that uh, I'm making is I'm trying to give people a full sense of what both the U.S. perspective is and the Russian perspective is. And when bringing up Russia's perspective, it's not necessarily to say that they're correct in their entire perspective. It's more to say, here's what their argument is, here's where they're, where they're coming from, because you, you simply, like, you don't hear on CNN or MSNBC or any mainstream outlets, you don't really hear anything about why they do some of the things that they do, or what, even if you say it's a bullshit justification or rationalization uh, for what they're doing, it is, you know, one of the uh, parts of the consideration. So uh, if, if you heard what I said and thought like, you know, that means Kyle saying it wouldn't be a crisis or it wouldn't be aggression uh, for Russia to go into Ukraine or when Russia did go into Crimea or when Russia went into Georgia. No, I think those things are bad and wrong and condemnable. I just think in order to talk about the thing, we have to provide uh, what we think are the perspectives of both sides in the disagreement. Okay, I totally get that. Um, and I understand the importance of acknowledging where Russia is coming at this from. But it felt like the language you, you were using went beyond um, si like understanding their side and went more towards kind of legitimizing theirs beyond a extent to which I think is justifiable. So, for example, calling... Um, uh, for NATO to retreat back to its original post-World War II borders, a reasonable ask, or like sort of saying that... Post-Cold War borders, not World War sorry, II. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. sorry, sorry, my, my bad, yeah, post-Cold War. Um, or saying that uh, Eastern Ukraine, because of its ethnic composition, would be more uh, amenable to Russian annexation than the rest of Ukraine. Um, the perspective that I got while watching the video was that you were okay with essentially all of the former USSR being like a buffer state, like just a, a an untouchable ring of nations that Russia has the ability to prey on at will without NATO or any Western entity either investing in or defending them. So there are spe specific things that Russia has laid out in the negotiations that are going on behind the scenes with Anthony Blinken as like, hey, here's what we're asking for. Um, and I bring it up in the video here. I'll, I'll quote it for you. Russia's demands include a legally binding halt to NATO's eastward expansion and a withdrawal of NATO troops from countries like Poland and Baltic nations that used to be aligned with or part of the Soviet Union. And the U.S.'s response to that has basically been, um, those are non-starters. We're not even going to consider any aspect of that. Uh, but what we will have a conversation about is military exercises. So like, you know, maybe we won't any longer do war games on the border in, I think it's Belarus, but don't quote me on that. I'll pull it up in a second if, if you don't recall which place uh, no, it is. I, that they I, just did war in games. the area, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they, they said, we'll have a conversation, but military exercises are on the table in these negotiations if you want to have the negotiations and the our placement of missiles are on the table. So if there's, you know, missiles that we have in uh, some ally uh, country that's close to yours that, you know, we can maybe agree on, we'll move those out of here. Uh, so that's what the U.S. is saying. That's the U.S.'s line. Um, my position on it is, and I'd be very curious to hear what your position on it is, um, there are certain things that I would say um, the U.S. should use as bargaining chips, like the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, for example, is one thing. Uh, I actually think that we should also use as leverage the idea of arming uh, states in the region. But beyond that, I actually don't think those asks of Russia are unreasonable. I think that um, it is true that when the Soviet Union broke up, the whole idea of those post-Soviet states is that these are like buffer states between the West and Russia. And those states, in theory, were supposed to remain neutral. Now they're 
you know, no longer neutral, or many of them have joined NATO. And I understand why, from the Russian perspective, they view this as aggression on the part of the West. So I guess, which things do you think are negotiable and which things do you think are not negotiable um, in trying to avoid some sort of catastrophe or World War III or some sort of a hot war? I think the U.S. is in the right, at least with regards to negotiating chips. I don't think those were supposed to be buffer states. They're sovereign nations. And if they make the decision to align more with the West, which makes sense because we're wealthier and less autocratic than Russia is, at least, um, I, I think that's their right to. Likewise, with withdraw withdrawing NATO support, withdrawing NATO support from Poland because Russia says so seems to me like a capitulation to authoritarianism that's like a alongside some of the worst imperialism possible today. You know, they want NATO there, Estonia, what have you. They want NATO there. It's their choice um, because they know that NATO, the only purpose NATO really serves anymore is to keep Russia's hands off a country. Um, and I think that's fine, because uh, because Russia's pretty bad, honestly. Um, you know, th these countries are scared of Russia, and I can't blame them for feeling that way. Because Russia, like Russia, is one of the few countries these days who will just annex neighboring countries, uh, which is wild. Like that's very much not a thing that is supposed to happen anymore. Um, it, it feels like so much of the expectations that have been levied on the former. USSR satellite nations, you know, Eastern Europe and what have you, um, are, are just a product of Russia's continuing antagonism and their unwillingness to get with the times. They're not strong enough to be an empire that can provide for their neighbors, the way China potentially could with their own geopolitical sphere of influence. Russia has to bully neighboring countries into submission, which, not to say the US doesn't do that, but it's like the US has the carrot and the stick. And in terms of NATO expansion, for the countries that get NATO, that's the carrot. They want us there. Russia just has a lot of sticks. I don't think we should pull out of out of NATO here. I think that I think these these sovereign nations have a right to defend themselves, but they're never going to do it on their own terms. They they need our help for that. So let me ask you this: What do you think would happen if, in theory, the U.S. said, "You know what? We're going to sign a legally binding halt to NATO's eastward expansion." And we're going to withdraw NATO troops from Poland and Baltic nations that used to be part of the Soviet Union. Do you think that if the U.S. were to do that, that Putin would then in turn like actually try to invade and reconstitute the entire Soviet Union? Do you think he would go further than that and try to you know go to other parts of Europe? Or do you think that um, that might actually lead to a situation where uh, we're closer to peace and, you know, it almost squashes the beef. No, I, I think he would just try to rebuild the Soviet Union. Um, I think that he it probably wouldn't be full annexation of most of these territories because that would be militarily unsustainable. It would probably be a decades-long process continuing from what he already does, which is he funds secessionist groups in neighboring countries. He uses... Um, you know, his intel agencies to spread disinfo and propaganda. He does this globally, but he especially does this with right-wing groups in neighboring countries. He will manufacture crises and then become the only person who can solve it. He will make the population desperate for a strong man to solve the problems that were caused in part due to political instability he brought about, and then he will be their savior. But any country can do that, you know, just as an abuser can convince the abused that they're dependent on them. Uh, I don't think that's Russia building allies. I just think that's Putin competently engaging in neo-colonialism. I don't think he would stop. And I don't think that like, I don't think Russia's apparent antagonism towards NATO has anything to do with the sincere anxiety over invasion. NATO would never invade Russia. It's like the idea of like, like NATO being in Ukraine, like it would never be a staging ground. Russia's a nuclear power. It was just, like I, I, in terms of defensive action, I think that NATO's presence is just a rationale for outward expansion. But we've seen this with authoritarians before. Even absent a rationale, they'll still do it. Um, they'll just, you know, they'll say other stuff. They, 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 they'll, they'll manufacture other crises. I agree that NATO wouldn't actually try to topple the Russian government. 
but I disagree in the sense that I think they actually think NATO would do that because when you look at the West track record, I mean, we militarily support 73% of the world's dictatorships. We have 900 military bases all around the world. We did an illegal and offensive war in Iraq against a country that didn't attack us. And you know the laundry list. You talk about this stuff all the time too. It goes on and on and on. So even though I don't think NATO is looking to topple the Russian government, I think that from the Russian perspective, they genuinely fear the closer NATO gets to their border, the more they fear unstable like NATO might actually do something. And, and to answer the question that I pose to you, look, maybe I'm naive and I'd be, if I'm wrong, I'd be more than happy to admit I'm wrong if we were to try this experiment and I was incorrect. But I think that if we were to say some of your demands are legitimate, some of your demands are fair, so let's sign a, a, a deal to legally binding deal to halt NATO's expansion eastward, I think what would happen is either it would sort of squash the beef or uh, you'd get a situation sort of like similar to what you outlined, which is certain areas that Russia views as vital for um, geopolitical reasons. They might annex them like Crimea. The whole, you know, they literally took Crimea. They might uh, go into eastern Ukraine and take that. But I think that the idea of, you know, expanding beyond that would it is politically impossible and not feasible. And even Vladimir Putin, as deeply authoritarian as he is, he knows there's really no prayer, no hope of, you know, reconstituting the old Soviet Union. And even if we take the worst case scenario of what I just described there, we then get into the deeper question, which is, uh, you know, I think the, the easier question, which is, what can we actually do about that? Like in the real world, what can we actually do about that? Because um, we don't have the, the international uh, credibility or even the intent to sort of uphold uh, human rights globally like we pretend to have. So since we're not like a fair arbiter of it, uh, it seems like we're just sort of stuck in a paradox where there are no good answers. Yeah, well, I acknowledge that the United States isn't great at worldwide diplomacy um it'd be pretty silly of me to believe that it was but i don't know if that has anything to do with the logistics of this situation um nato is 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 pretty capable of handling itself and of course given the fact that ukraine is in europe and europe is essentially the strongest bastion of allies we have we do have a disproportionate interest in managing conflict in that region as opposed to say you know the middle east or you know uh, northern africa but um in terms of this, I guess a lot of these points feel like they're adjacent, but not really relevant. Our track record of human rights abuses abroad is horrendous, but I don't know if it has anything to do with this. Essentially, appeasement, because because it is, right? Like, you know, he'll take eastern Ukraine and stop is essentially appeasement. Um, it may well be the case that he does just take eastern Ukraine and stop, but there are still a lot of people who live there. Um, I mean, even if you're like removing NATO, uh, p moving them back to their post-Cold War um, territories, it feels like it, it opens up a swath of the world, hundreds of millions of people uh, who have no way of defending themselves against Russia at just sort of waiting. Uh, they're never so, going to be able to build a military to defend themselves, not against, I mean, not against Russia, right? So it's it's really just like the hope that they play nice because we couldn't intervene without NATO um, we wouldn't have really a mechanism for securing, um, you know, for, from preventing that expansion. Um, I guess, I guess the real difference is that like the West and the East both want to expand into, uh, Eastern Europe. The West does it with incentives and Russia does it with propaganda campaigns and annexation. Uh, not to say we don't do our own propaganda campaigns, but, you know, NATO involvement is definitely preferable to, like, annexation, I would say. It just seems like a preferable system to defend. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that, I mean, from their perspective, and just when you look at the world uh, objectively, we don't have the track record uh, to be able to lay a claim to being some sort of neutral arbiter in the conversation. So I think that makes it um, a lot more messy. I just, and, and let me be clear, if, if Vladimir Putin takes Eastern Ukraine, 
that is very bad. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not one of the people who says like, uh, or who number one acts like that's not going to happen or it's not even in the realm of possibility. I think it's very likely that he'll do that. I think the question that I get stuck on is more, what can we actually feasibly do about that? And to, I think we need to lean in as much as we can to negotiation and diplomacy right now. And I don't think that doing that is akin to Neville Chamberlain appeasing Hitler, because I don't think Vladimir Putin is Hitler. I think Vladimir Putin is a domestic menace to his own people and an authoritarian, but there's a big difference between somebody with global domination ambitions and somebody who in a very limited sense, even though it's absolutely terrible and negative, might have minor territorial expansion goals where, again, we're not even in a position to do anything about that without sparking a much worse conflict. This is the language that I mean, though. Minor territorial acquisition goals is an extremely well, I mean that, charitable way. Well, I just mean that empirically, Bosch, because again, my sense is if we were to agree to the, the things that were laid out on the table by Russia, I genuinely think either it would squash the beef, number one, or worst case scenario, you'd see just like they did in Georgia, just like they did in Crimea, and right now with Eastern Ukraine. In other words, there's a limit to what he can do and what's politically feasible because of um, Europe being right there and the states that are already part of NATO. But you want so, them to retreat all the way past Poland, which would give um, Russia a territory encompassing about a third of a billion people, potentially with no threat of Western interference. Well, so that's why, remember before I mentioned the thing about weapons, how that's not something I would take off the table. I mean, these are sovereign nations. So if these sovereign nations want the ability to protect themselves from any potential uh, war with Russia, they absolutely have the right to do that. So one of the things that I would use as leverage in these negotiations is the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And the other thing I'd say is, I don't care if you if Russia says there's a red line around arming these sovereign nations, too bad. I mean, they're sovereign nations. And so they have the right to protect themselves. So, uh, you know- We're arming the hell out of is, Ukraine right now, which I think is nice. We are. Yeah, I mean, that's, look, given the the facts, given what happened in Georgia, and given what happened in Crimea, it's that's not unreasonable for, for Ukraine to want to be armed against a potential Russian invasion. But in, fa in fact, what we've seen is because of what happened in uh, Crimea and because of what happened in Georgia, um, now you have a much stronger pro-Ukrainian government sentiment in Ukraine, much more so than before, because uh, Putin's being so heavy handed with what he's doing. There's a backlash effect, and that makes people want to run into the arms of the West even more. That is true. Uh, you know, surge for uh, uh, NATO support surge in Ukraine after 2014. Um, so I, I have to, I have to uh, uh, drill on a few of these points. You say that the U.S. isn't a neutral arbiter, which I agree with, but I don't think we have to be because the Ukrainian people want NATO. Um, they don't want to be invaded. And whatever pockets of like pro-Russian sentiment there are in Ukraine seem to be at the very least heavily coerced by uh, uh, you know, a program of Russian-backed separatist movements and propaganda. So it, we're talking about the scales being tipped, and even with them being tipped, they're still heavily in the favor of Western interventionism through NATO occupation. Um, and, and, and you talk about, like, what the Russian people think or what they fear. Keep in mind that after 9-11, the United States was convinced that Saddam Hussein was about to, like, fly over to America and start suplexing the rest of our um, Manhattan skyline. Uh, like, I, I, I'm not particularly concerned with what they think is going to happen, more so what will. And nobody will ever invade Russia as long as Russia is a nuclear power. Maybe involvement, possibly, funding separatist movements, sure, you know, that's game. But invasion just isn't going to happen. Which makes, it seems like Russia's playing kind of the cry bully, where they're through the perceived threat of being attacked, justifying actual attacks against their neighboring countries. And I don't know if they're going to stop with that because Putin's no dummy. He knows he can't be invaded by, you know, NATO. And that suggests to me that the motivation here isn't a sincere desire to establish a thin line of buffer states. It is outward conquest. It, Russia is one of, it, it maybe at the moment, the only country engaging in the kind of open, outward, aggressive expansionism that it is. I don't know if anything else is comparable. Maybe 
some of the conflicts taking place in the Middle East in, in their own scale or Sudan split. I, 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 it is it is. Yeah, China's doing their own thing, but China has other options on the table. I just I don't think this is minor. I think this is part of a deliberate strategy to push NATO influence out of sovereign nations that want NATO. So he has a larger playground to fuck with without worrying about the West interfering. Yeah, so there's a few points I have in response to that. I, I mean, I one of our disagreements is that I think Russia genuinely fears the West and genuinely fears NATO. Uh, you, you think it's more of the cry bully thing where it's like, you know, they don't really fear it. They know they're not going to get invaded. So they're just using that as the excuse to, to, to do what they want to do anyway. Uh, I take your point. It's possible. But I also understand why, from their perspective, they might actually feel, fear NATO and might actually fear the West, because not just because of our record where we invade 17 countries before brunch. Um, not OK. Well, I just just to hold to. Mm -hmm, yep. We we don't invade nuclear powers. And. Are we talking about what the Russian people fear or the government? It's not a democracy, really, right? So the, what the people, the people will fear what they're told to fear. There's Russian state media that tells them what to fear. The government, I think, given the intel they have, couldn't reasonably believe NATO would ever engage in direct military boots on the ground action with them, the second largest nuclear power on Earth. Well, it's true. Like, I, I think that... Uh, uh you know, an actual invasion is very unlikely and the Russian government knows that it's unlikely, but there are other ways in which the U.S. can fuck with them. And they're even on the conversation in the conversation right now, like, for example, cutting them off from the world banking system, for example, crippling sanctions sure. against the country. At yeah. this point, I um, mean, if they're going to do what they're doing, we're running out of options, right? We can't put boots on the ground, but so let's uh, we, we can come back to that. But I want to talk about the there's a genuine paradox here that I don't know the answer to it. I don't know how to get around it. But Ukraine, so you're right, there's a pro-Western sentiment in Ukraine, um, in I would say most of Ukraine. There are little parts that are more ethnically Russian where they don't feel that way, but that's a minor point. What do you do in a paradox where, and just, just go with me on this hypothetical, because I know you don't agree with my reading of this part of the situation, but what if um, we actually could achieve peace by agreeing to the the things that Russia says. Like, hey, you need to do these things. And we go, you know what? Okay, we're gonna do those things. What if that actually got us peace? But then you have Ukraine democratically of their own volition says, look, we don't care about your little deal here, which you know may have gotten us peace, but we don't care about that. We're a sovereign nation. We wanna be in NATO, regardless of the fact that this deal is working and, and it's leading to peace. How do you address that? Because on the one hand, look, we support democracy. If a sovereign nation decides it wants to do something, it has a right to do something. But what if at the same time, the them doing that then sparks a broader conflict? Like, wouldn't you agree that that's, uh, just going with my logic for a second, that perhaps meeting these demands might actually lead to peace. What do you do in a paradox like that? Because there, I don't think there's any easy answer there. I think that it's nothing but, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult no matter how you look at it. And then beyond that, if we agree that, hey, a, a sovereign nation has the right to democratically choose whatever they want on the international stage. Okay, well then what do we do in a situation where say Texas democratically decided we wanna withdraw from the United States of America or the ethnically Russian parts of Ukraine decide, well, we wanna withdraw from Ukraine and go and be part of Russia. You see what I'm saying? Like there's no good answers here. It's nothing but paradox, paradoxes within paradoxes. Well, I think, First of all, the only sovereign nation whose behavior is threatening peace in the region right now is, of course, Russia. Ukraine wasn't going to invade Russia. So in terms of like nations threatening peace in spite of the demands of every other country on Earth, they're the one doing that. And like trusting Russia when they say, hey, dude, just pull your defensive pact out of all the countries we used to brutally suppress under the USSR. It'll be fine. It'd be like listening to a wolf tell you that he'll stop raiding the hen coop as soon as you like get rid of the locks. I don't know. It, well, it, that's why it, I asked you to go with my hypothetical. Well, like, it, I know. It, I mean, with the with the hypothetical, I mean, it would be like, what if Hitler stopped after the Sudetenland, right? I mean, in the hypothetical where I, well, well, I, I, I just don't agree with those analogies, Walsh. I just in, don't agree with them. In the hypothetical, you're presupposing a set of conditions that I don't think is likely to happen. If okay, that fair did enough. Happen, that's your answer. If that did happen, if Russia 
uh, if Russia and I, and I don't know why because I don't think Russians Russia's really threatened by NATO expansion. The only thing it denies them is the ability to just invade neighboring countries. But um, if 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 they're if they actually did just stop, if all this really is just a reflexive, uh, you know, fear of uh, NATO's expansion, I guess I would still take issue with the fact that we what we needed for peace in our time was to undermine the sovereignty of Eastern European nations in order to appease the paranoia of the Russian government. That would be the best case scenario. Like, I guess we're normalizing the idea that big countries get to just decide who small countries are you know, buddies with or have defensive pacts with. Like, I would take issue with the United States saying like, oh, sorry, Mexico, you can't be part of this social democratic, like, uh, you know, a Latin American alliance or whatever, you know, with a defensive pact. Uh, because the only reason we would ever not want that would be if we had plans to invade Mexico, which I hope we don't do um, anytime in the near future. But it, yeah. it, I, I guess, I guess at the end of the day, it, I mean, what I want is peace, and the great peace breaker here seems to be Russia, but I don't think that kowtowing to the demands that don't seem to be motivated by actual geopolitical threats will change anything. I feel like the only thing we can do at this point is starve Russia out. Uh, we're wealthier than them by metrics. I mean, uh, ally with all the countries in their uh, periphery, sanction, uh, you know, sanction their leaders, cripple their economy, wait for them to bleed out, and then when they're ready to play ball, they Jeez. can be a nice, compliant country. I mean, but there's a lot of civilians that get hurt in that scenario. In no? eastern Ukraine as well, yeah. But if if no, they're I mean, going to be like that... if we the sanctions that, on Russia, is what I'm saying, that would hurt a lot of civilians. Not as much as their missile strikes would hurt eastern Ukrainians, right? Again, keep in mind, this isn't out of spite. If they're going to keep year after year invading and annexing neighboring countries, the way we used to solve this was by going in there and killing people who made decisions in their leadership. But they're a nuclear power. We can't do that. So I think we have to find a way of dealing with them. I don't think that they're just going to stop. I think they know that they're a nuclear power. They know we can't do anything direct. And they take advantage of that by commanding far more authority than their economy uh you know fairly would allow otherwise i think that our main disagreements come down to um whether or not the asks of russia in this negotiation are reasonable and what the ultimate goal is of russia i, I think that you i mean you genuinely seem to believe it is somewhat analogous to like hitler right in the nazi germany yeah, well, uh, keep in mind, I don't think that Hitler was exceptional. Um, the the idea of autocratic nation leaders like getting away with territorial acquisition is something that was the norm for all of human history. Um, you know, we, we it, it, World War II was only what eighty years ago. Uh, Russia gets away with more than it would be able to otherwise because it's a nuclear power. But the idea of an autocrat like relentlessly expanding, conquering territories, making their neighbors miserable, I don't think that's like. A super unique or special thing. I just think it's more difficult these days because the countries that have the armies capable of fielding that kind of destruction usually are bordering nuclear countries. So we can't do that anymore. They can because since Russia was the inheritor state for the USSR, they got to keep all the nukes, even though they were stationed in countries all across Eastern Europe in the Warsaw Pact. Now that they're not the inheritor states, they got nothing. So now Poland and all of Eastern Europe have no way of defending themselves against invasion. Not to say nuclear proliferation is a good thing, but it's a good deterrent, if nothing else. And and Russia gets to keep all the big boy bombs. So I, I, I don't think it's exceptional, the idea that they would invade their neighbors, you know? Well, I think Hitler was exceptional in the sense that he had genuine world domination goals. And so I still think that puts him not in a league of his own, but among even a, 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 you know, a minority percentage of even authoritarians. So in other words, I think as terrible as Vladimir Putin is, and he's terrible, um, I, I don't think he's analogous to Hitler in that sense. So I think to look at the actions of the Russian government as if they're... What about Alexander the Great? Or Genghis Khan. We don't have to go to Hitler. Like, well, that's why. Well, that's why I said a, a minority of authoritarian. I think that most authoritarians are interested in being authoritarian, but they're fine with, uh, you know, certain 
territorial acquisition that, that does not encompass the entire globe. I, I mean, I don't it's know. It's not a defense. It... I'm not defending. It's a, it's a, it's, I'm just I don't trying know to inject some can... nuance into the conversation because no. I don't think the comparisons of Putin to Hitler, I think that would make reasonable people think that then almost anything is okay in trying to uh, deal with him. And in fact, if people really believe that, it's like, why even bother with diplomacy? Why even bother with negotiations? I mean, we should be deploying the troops right this very second. Well, that would indeed... trigger World War III, right? I, I mean, keep, keep in mind, the only reason we're talking like Hitler comparison is because the term appeasement is most commonly associated with him. And that's what I feel you've sort of touched on at least a little bit here. But yeah, in, terms I, well, of, that's the... in terms of expansionism, like this has been a thing for thousands of years. We're just talking about post-industrial societies. We're limited to countries with nukes invading countries without nukes. And Russia is unique in that they're bordering so many of those countries. But outside of that like uh, the i don't want to get caught up in the hitler comparison because i feel like a lot of the stuff that weighs down any like hitler allegory is going to be pertaining to stuff that isn't related to expansionism we don't think of hitler as hitler because of expansionism there are plenty of people who did that we think of him because of the holocaust but i'm not talking about any holocausting here i'm just talking about rampant expansionism which russia has done has been doing since the end of the Cold War. You know, obviously you have Georgia and you have um, the Chechnya, uh, Chechnya, uh, you know, uh, the, the, that shenanigan. Uh, you have, you know, Crimea, you Crimea, have Ukraine now, right. right? Yeah, like this is unique. Other countries don't tend to do this, not in the way that Russia's doing right now, at least. I don't think it's that unreasonable. Like, was the Crimean annexation because they were scared of NATO? Was Georgia because they were scared of NATO? Chechnya because they were scared of NATO? I don't think they're afraid of NATO. I think they just want power. Uh, so, and, and I don't, and so, so for that reason, removing NATO from Eastern Europe isn't about making them safer. It's about making us weaker and Eastern Europe more vulnerable. So I read in preparation uh, for our conversation uh, a good piece called Why NATO Has Become a Flashpoint with Russia in Ukraine. It's in the uh, Council of Foreign Relations, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and then I read another piece from NPR that was on this that was um, really good. And they talk about how leading, when you had um, Vladimir Putin invade Crimea and of Putin invade Georgia, directly leading up to that was, uh, one of them was a global conference. I don't know if it was UN or, or some other conference where one of them was like when they formally invited, invited Ukraine to join NATO. And now they have them on a list of like, well, countries that will join in the future at some unspecified date. And all of these uh, outwardly aggressive actions from Russia um, came at a time directly after uh, the conference where Ukraine was formally invited. And directly after there was expansion of other countries into NATO, I actually have the list of them right here. And so what you see is this, this through line of like, if it's not linked to that at the very least, let's say it's not the whole reason for why Russia does it, because I don't buy that it's the whole reason that Russia does it, but it's certainly a factor in why they do what they do. And so if we can, this avoid that seems... then i don't see why i don't see why that's a bad thing in fact i think that's an intelligent thing i think that you know we need to try to get peace as much as possible and we we under no circumstance we want to be neville chamberlain in the sense that we're appeasing the unappeasable but that's my exact point is that i don't think this situation is beyond diplomacy and beyond negotiation and clearly the biden administration doesn't either the i'm not saying it's beyond diplomacy it's just it feels like you're buying their line like, oh, yeah, dude, the reason why we keep invading all these neighboring countries is because of Czech's notes, NATO expansion. Yeah, like, like, that's their line. It is always going to be the impetus of authoritarian governments to justify the reason why they engage in expansionism. Keep in mind, I'm pretty sure Hitler described the invasion of Poland as a defensive action. Um, Russia had those false flag apartment bombings before invading Chechnya, where it turned out that, hey, 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 it looks like Russia may have faked that in order to manufacture consent for, you know, so But you're so conflating a justification with an explanation. I'm not just, I, I don't think they should have done any of those things. They shouldn't have invaded Crimea. They shouldn't have invaded um, Georgia. They shouldn't be doing what they're doing but now. I'm just trying to, to look at Western why. Imperialism is the justification by saying that 
by 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 saying isn't it like, a factor though isn't it's not even a little factor in your mind i genuinely don't think so i think that our presence there deters them more than anything but by that being the link if it's it's like it's like if a it's like if an abusive husband beats his wife and one of the things that set him off was that she miscooked the meal like technically that like maybe if she hadn't cooked it poorly it wouldn't have happened but there was an, a, another set of issues that would have been a problem even if the meal had been cooked perfectly and you're always playing with dice in situations like that i think that western imperialism is omnipresent right like it, we touch every corner of the globe and we fuck a lot of it up too so if you're willing to defend bad behavior by linking it but to western it's not imperialism defending. See, no, sorry, sorry. Well, they do. They defend it. They because they'll, you know, they they do draw those links. The reason they're saying they're going to invade Ukraine right now is because of NATO expansion. When you yeah, draw that and link, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. When they do that, that's right, but, bullshit. But it's always I get that. It's I agree always with that. like, eh, but there's well, a link, right? Like, no, people, but we had, but Vosh, I I don't agree with your analogy because we have to discuss all of the factors that might lead to what's going on right now, and we need to, if there is a way out of this situation. We have to diagnose it and find it so as so we can avoid World War III and we can avoid agree, potential yeah. conflict. So uh, I guess uh, I just want to pose to you the question again, because this is what it all comes down to. We could talk all day and night about who's to blame, who's not to blame, what percentage are they to blame, so on and so forth. But given the facts that we have right now, and in fact, let's go a step further and stipulate that the invasion does happen, okay, which I think is likely. Um, what do we do? What exactly, uh, what what actions do you take policy-wise if you're President Biden or you're Blinken and you're in control of the situation? What's on the table? What's off the table? What do you think is the best way forward? Well, I guess my hope would be that you arm the Ukrainians so as many Russians die on the way in as possible. The more bloody a war it is, the less favorable it'll be, it'll be to the Russian population, which could decrease internal support and cause agitation that makes it difficult for Putin to capitalize on future antagonism to justify a war. Historically, wars raise your approval rating as long as they go well and they're over quickly. The longer they drag on and the more bloody they get and the more news footage reels you get of your soldiers dying in the snow, the less likely it is that the population's gonna be gung-ho for another one. The Russian population seem to like the annexation of Crimea. They seem to like a lot of the imperialism that Putin engages in because of their in and out. But now Ukraine is armed to the teeth. Uh, we have supplied them with a lot of weapons. And I think that's fantastic. Russia can't really use that as a justification for nuclear warfare because there's no actual engagement between us and NATO or them and NATO troops. I don't want Biden sending people into Ukraine directly because again, World War Three. But I think I think the most that we can do is make imperialism painful for Russia. I think that we should remind them that they're weak and we are strong and that their way of looking at the world and their attitude towards the world would have only continued working if they were strong like us. Um, but they're not. They're weak. And for that reason, uh, they they have to break their backs against Ukraine. Uh, if we could do that, and maybe they back off this whole thing. I mean, at this point, that'd be really bad for them if they backed off. It'd make them look really weak. Ukraine's cemented now as a Western ally. Um, but you know, if that does take place, whatever needs to be done to oust Putin, whatever oligarchical interests exist there, they need to fall in line. It's just, it's not 1978 anyway. It's not, what was, when was the Cuban Missile Crisis? 68? It's, 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 it's not the Cuban Missile Crisis era anymore. There are two world powers. And if you're not them rabble rousing, uh, you know, by, by running around invading countries with a GDP lower than my household, um, is uh is just not an effective way of maintaining global peace they need to just chill out they can join china's geopolitical block um and we should probably throw their nukes into the sun and our own but probably theirs first yeah. so um so my, what my answer to my own question would be is and there's some of this that you're going to agree with and some of it you're going to disagree with but hear out the whole thing and then you can respond i would do a legally binding halt to nato's eastward expansion and um I would, the things I would put on the table, so let's assume he actually invades, um, I would, I would arm Ukraine, but with an asterisk, because I don't want to arm the ones in the Azov battalion who are extremist right-wingers and are, <laughs> you know, 
they admit 10 to 20 percent of them are nazis i think the number is much higher than that, that should be avoided just, yeah it's much yeah they have so. nike uh, they have nazi iconography and they do the salute and all that stuff so i would arm uh you know actors who are non-extremists i have no problem arming them and what i would do is uh axe the pipeline and cut a deal with germany where we will sell them oil even if we have to subsidize it sell them the natural gas that they want uh, at the same price they were getting from Russia just to undercut them and uh, to, to extract a penalty for what they're doing. But outside of arming sovereign nations and axing the pipeline, uh, I mean, I know you disagree with this, but I think some of the asks about NATO's expansion, I do think they're reasonable. And I think that uh, we should have never really expanded it in the first place. And I'm, look, I don't want to open Pandora's box here, but NATO's already around, it already exists, and it strikes me as not feasible that it would be dismantled in any real sense. But I don't even think they necessarily should have existed in the first place. Do you disagree with that? With with NATO? Yeah. Um, it seemed like a geopolitical inevitability given the state of the Cold War, but I mean, there were a lot of things in the Cold War that I wish hadn't happened. I wish the Na I wish NATO had not been something the West had considered necessary in its time. Uh, likewise for both powers, I suppose. Though NATO and the Warsaw Pact weren't perfectly analogous, obviously. So I guess outside of my thing where I, I would stop NATO's eastward expansion, it doesn't seem like you disagree with me on too much beyond that, other than maybe, like, I think the whatever sanctions package you would levy against Russia, I think would maybe be a little more harsh than the one that I would, because I want to try to avoid as much as possible any harm on Russian civilians. I have no yeah. problem inflicting harm on the Russian government, Putin, and the oligarchs. But once you start harming the civilians, then I, I wince and I think we're actually, maybe we're being the baddies in that scenario. Oh, I mean, we're always the baddies. Um, I think in terms of sanctions, I don't know. There obviously like intent and application are uh, difficult um, to, to perfectly um, align. I always thought like, Especially since there are so many Russian oligarchs who do business in the U.S., probably just freezing their assets. If you could find a way to target like government officials and the wealthy and just like, oh, you have like a vacation house in the U.S. Oh, you have businesses here. Oh, sorry. No, you don't. If you have a problem with it, take it up with Putin. Get the fuck out of Ukraine. You know, I feel like that'd be pretty effective because it's not like they have a functioning democracy anyway. So you make the people angry. It's not going to do anything other than get them more jazzed up for the next war against the imperialist West. But if you have all the wealthy like shit sons, uh, you know, oil baron tycoon fucks who are over here in the U.S., uh, you know, ex Epstein buddy types um, getting their assets frozen by the state. That, that'd be that'd be funny. Um, I think it'd mostly just be funny. And uh, that's why I want it to happen. Yeah, I, I, I total agreement on going after the oligarchs. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, and one of the reasons why, to tie back in something we talked about a little earlier, I think one of the reasons why the fear of the West is sincere in Russia is that, um, you know, when the Soviet Union broke up, I mean, they went through a decade of absolute pain. And it was when there was, you know, neoliberalism enforced from the outside. And then basically you had this rapid swing from Soviet style communism to uh, basically oligarchy. And you had, uh, rampant deregulation and they opened the markets up, but they also had hyperinflation. And when you had uh, Gorbachev, Gorbachev was a disaster. And then Yeltsin came in on an anti-corruption platform and he was the most corrupt. And so you had like 10 years. Very Russian. You, you had 10 years of, you know, just extreme pain when they made that shift to a capitalist economy. So that's one of the reasons that would genuinely explain why they fear any sort of further westward expansion towards their borders. Cause they're like, these guys aren't looking out for our best interest. I guess we do agree on some of the underpins here. And I do, I, I agree that a general distrust of the West is warranted from every human alive on earth. Um, though, although I don't think the threat of NATO invasion is, is reasonable or grounded. I will say- I agree, I agree on that point. I just right, think for, that even, if, like, if they think that, right, they disagree. But like, again, like the people in America thought that ISIS was gonna like spring up in Wisconsin. So I, right. I you know, yeah. right, mm -hmm. the, you know, we, it's, we, we fear what we're told to fear and they have even less control over their media consumption than we do. Um, and that's Correct. something too for yeah. fucking mm -hmm. for Americans. But I guess what, what I wanna know is like, let's say this plays out, let's say this plays out the way I don't know, maybe one in three, one in four, you, you'd expect it happens. Russia invades uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine. They take Eastern Ukraine. 
and mm -hmm. uh you know moving past the river moving further west it's it's too difficult it's not worth it so you have uh several months of skirmishes at the river's border and then you have like calls for an armistice whatever you know um the uh, we we pull nato back what do you do if russia continues its behavior because it's not just defensive, right? Russia does propaganda campaign shit all over the place from attempted coups, not saying we don't do this, mind you, but from attempted coups to, you know, paying off media figures to supporting secessionist movements. They have a very advanced, very sophisticated and very aggressive geopolitical strategy of essentially psyoping, you know, again, not to say we don't do this, but they engage in it to soften countries up for invasion, we tend to do it to soften countries up for McDonald's franchising deals. Not to say that there isn't an issue with that, but uh, you know, we're not we're not prepping Mexico for for U.S. annexation. Um, if they continue engaging in this behavior, it just it seems like there's so much they're doing to make the world weak to their behavior. You had the Russiagate stuff, of course, over here where they were spreading disinfo in America, and you have the you know the the broader uh, there was that stuff the, the the UK figured out where they were like planning that that coup. And if you go to any Eastern European country, any citizen of any of those countries will be able to tell you about their country's unique history with post-Soviet Union Russia and how they've tried to delegitimize their government. You know, if they keep doing and this seems aggressive, not defensive. If they keep doing it, what do you do? What happens if the bargaining chips aren't enough? So if that happens, um, then one, I mean, once they hit a NATO country, if they keep expanding and they eventually go into a NATO country, I mean, batten down the hatches, all bets are off. Um, and, you know, you're looking best case scenario at like global economic warfare, but worst case scenario, that's when you're in World War III. That, you know, that's when that happens and uh, there's no avoiding it. What about before they hit the original NATO borders? Because there are still hundreds of millions of people between Russia and the original borders of NATO. Well, that's when, like I said, the, the, the only things I put on the table right now, given the facts of the situation, are arming Ukraine, arming post-Soviet states in so far as they'd like to be armed, and axing the pipeline. If they start, like, let's say they don't, they're still in, they're not in a NATO state yet, but they're beyond what we both expect would happen, which is they're going to stay east of the river. Well, that's probably when you put on the table exactly what you just mentioned before, which is maybe a harsher set of sanctions in order to try to um, get them to not do that. But that's why this is such a paradox more generally is because if you're the president and you're sitting in the Oval Office and these are the facts that are presented to you, it's like, God, what do you do? That's such a difficult decision because you really are now having the conversation about actions that you know, in their mind might merit some sort of World War III level response and nobody wants a World War III level response. So it's almost like we have to do anything that we can to seems, avoid that. Seems like they're the problem, huh? Seems like uh, seems like some Navy SEAL ship might be the uh, only solution we have past a point. We can't invade Russia ever. It's not possible for us to do so unless we have access to some technology I am not aware of. You know, I, I, if they just settled down and learned to be compliant like the entire world had to even to an extent america as well because you know we uh we have um trade relations we have to maintain that we can't if we invade otherwise sovereign nations uh like say our neighbors mexico and canada we have to now, these days america is so cucked by geopolitics that we have to invade countries like afghanistan my God, Russia clearly, un, you know, unbecomen by the modern order, uh, thinks uh, Ukraine is an acceptable target, which to me is just wild. I, I, I mean, there are so many people they could get before they hit the original, the original borders, like Poland. Poland's like a strong ally, you know. Well, let me ask you, Vosh, uh -huh. don't you think that like the way that Obama handled it when they took Crimea. Don't you think ultimately that that was the best way to handle it because it didn't lead to widespread further conflict? And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was actually France that negotiated, um, you know, an armistice with that eventually, a ceasefire with that eventually. But don't you think that, that was actually handled in a very effective way by the global community, given that that happened in 2014 and here we are in 2022. So we're eight years later before we had another problem pop up. No, I think I think we're I think we're still kind of doing the appeasement thing, basically. 
we should have realized Russia never had any intention of becoming a modern country like the rest of the uh, post-Soviet Union nations. They want to be their own little undead zombie empire. And it's, it's, it's weird. I mean, again, like the U.S. maintains geopolitical hegemony not us. Yes. Thank you, Chad. The U.S. maintains geopolitical hegemony um, through our economy. That's what we at the end of the day, like most of our military bases around the world exist as a kind of uh, bond of trust between ourselves and the countries that hold them. Because if our military bases are in a country, other people know that if that country is invaded, they fight the United States, which means that they get bombed the next day. So it, most of our military occupation globally is a product of a kind of shared alliance uh you know obviously that's not in its totality the majority of the aggression and um you know imperialism we engage in is born off the back of our economy but russia doesn't have an economy they can't do that and while i don't like neocolonialism i would sure as hell prefer neocolonialism with mcdonald's to regular colonialism <laughs> with hundreds of millions of people uh, having their territories annexed so if Russia if Russia insists on playing the game with the old set of rules, I don't know what you can do. I feel like we all just should have sanctioned Russia into oblivion and just waited until like things went quiet and then went in there and like picked up what was left. Because I don't even know if that would work. Maybe severe sanctions, they would consider this to be sufficient to, uh, you know, declare nuclear war because they have said that. They've said that being cut off from the global banking system would be considered an act of war on their part. And if you're declaring war on a country with nukes, then the implications necessarily follow. I don't know what the solution is. I just know that we have to be really, really careful about the justifications they employ to defend their unjustifiable behavior. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, my main point is, I think that some of the asks are actually reasonable. Some of the asks are not. Some of the asks are insane. The idea of, you know, the buffer states, post-Soviet states, cannot even be armed? No, that's ridiculous. Any sovereign nation has the right to be armed. And Why should they themselves. be buffer states, though? If they're sovereign nations, shouldn't they have a right to appeal to the Western Bloc for self-defense? Why should Russia's paranoia, like, interfere with their sovereignty? Well, see, this is what we talked about before, though, because I think there actually is a little bit of a paradox between if you do have the buffer states as buffer states, I do think that would make, uh, reduce tensions, and I do think that um, it is possible that that would squash the beef. You don't agree with that. You think that that's kind of crazy, but I just look, think it's a horrible thing to say to a Ukrainian, like, all right, like, or everyone in the no, region. Look, they're not, like, of course, they're not going to like it, but you got to understand, Vosh, I'm not, that's not even the position I'm taking. I'm just saying that there is a genuine paradox there because on the one hand, I support, in, you know, these sovereign nations decision to make their own decisions. They have the ability and they should be able to make their own decisions. But by the same token, uh, that might end up being something that gets in the way of broader peace. So it's like, that's what I'm saying. There's no good answers there in my mind. I, I get it. And I, I get it. If they want to, hey, we want to be part of NATO and NATO wants to welcome them in. The thing okay, I'm curious about. But there about, might be consequences to that. Yes. I feel like you would never take this stance if America was in Russia's position. The idea that, oh, sure, we're undermining the sovereignty of these sovereign nations uh, because America is being, you know, um, uh, is is engaging in imperialism they're paranoid you know we want we want them to not do it i like i've seen quite a lot of your content so i can say i think with great confidence you would never say that there is something different about russia it's the same reason why you're concerned about what russia thinks of the likelihood of nato's invasion but you would laugh at anyone who told you that america should invade like Iran because Americans are afraid of Iran invading America, right? There's something different about Russia. You have a different set of considerations, I a different no. threshold. You you wouldn't say that about the states. But hold though. on. I've but hold on. So I've I've actually when it comes to the issue of democratically choosing uh what to do in the context of the US, I've said I think we should do everything we possibly can to avoid any uh, you know state deciding of their own volition that they want to withdraw from the United States of America. But I have said, if push comes to shove and we've tried everything else and all else fails and Texas decided to vote to leave the United States of America, I mean, I can't necessarily oppose that. So I think I hold a similar standard for both the US and Russia and anybody when it comes to this stuff. The only thing I'm pointing out, and I'm not presenting an answer to this, I'm just pointing out that 
if you accept that some of the asks about NATO's eastward expansion are reasonable, and I do accept that, I think some of them are reasonable, then this is a paradox between if the buffer states remain buffer states, we might be able to have peace. If they're not uh, buffer states and they voluntarily choose to join NATO, that's good insofar as democracy is a good thing and sovereign nations deciding what they want on their own is a good thing. But I'm just saying that might actually get in the way of peace. But, I'm not but, even taking a position on that. I'm just saying that I that's a genuine that. paradox that exists. But the dynamic that you're posing is not one I feel like I've heard you pose before in other comparable situations. Because, for example, the biggest threat to peace right now is Russia. So you could phrase this from the opposite angle just as well. The reasonable asks of Ukraine, ask, is to have NATO in their country because they are currently about to be invaded. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's a paradox here, but at the end of the day, like, if we want peace, then we need to undermine the sovereignty of Russia uh, and, like, deny them the ability to invade by, like, sanctioning their country. If we're talking about supplanting the sovereignty of nations to, uh, to, to appeal to the desires of others, like, I just, I feel like that's not a take I normally hear, not just you, but people on the left engage in with an affirmative perspective from America. Should countries around the world be forced into compliance with the World Bank and IMF because the alternative would be unrest caused by America funding their dictators? You would say no. America does fund dictators, as you pointed out in this conversation, and we fund them because their corruption makes them amenable to Western business interests. But hey, at least they're not shaking the boat, right? Stirring the pot? If we're going to make this argument like, sorry, sovereign nations, you know, bigger countries uh, are uh, like demand peace and you're, you know, you're on the bargaining table uh, that this is not a trade we'd be willing to make for the sake of the United States. And we're cool. Russia's lame. We should be. I, I, I just I don't know. I mean, I could I, I could infer things here. I understand the left has a tendency to like, you know, America bad, everything else good. Like that's a first no. position, mm. you know, but dude, it, you're not you're not having a conversation with the tanky right now. And uh, there are I don't know how else to make it clear. I just feel like whenever I say something that's harshly critical of Russia, it's either swept aside or gets put in the bin of of course, that's the case. Uh, but whenever I give a perspective that is just trying to objectively describe a paradox that I think is real, you're insisting I'm taking a position on it as opposed to me just describing the paradox as such. So, I mean, I'll say it again. But I don't you, know how much you do have a position on it, don't Putin you? Putin is, what's that? You do have a position. You've said that you want NATO to retreat to its original borders. You do have a position on the paradox. But I acknowledge that maybe the right thing is for Ukraine to, if they voluntarily choose, we want to be part of NATO. The, who am I to say no to that? All I'm saying is that might actually spark a, a broader problem. So maybe I'm more agnostic than I initially laid out in that video, but I think that there are two competing principles there. One is holding up the, um, the right of sovereign nations to make their own decisions on the international stage. And the other one is uh, hopefully avoiding a conflict that might genuinely lead to World War III. And honestly, I have to say, I think that anybody who doesn't acknowledge that that's a real paradox there is just not looking at the situation as objectively as possible. Look, don't get me wrong. At the end of the day, the ultimate goal is to prevent World War III. Nuclear Armageddon is the greatest possible bat. Like it, every that, that's sort of the point I was trying to make too. No, you just I said it better than I did. <laughs> no, no, no. I no, I totally get that. It is the right. worst possible thing. You know, you can make moral compromises on the path to that. But from my perspective, while I do maintain that position, you know, anything and everything must be done to uh, I would ra I would rather send like an envoy of like orphaned children so Russian you know Putin could eat them and bathe in their blood like the, you could do anything it's nuclear war it's the worst thing it's there's nothing worse than it um but I approach that from the even if you accept that there are dynamics that you can invoke or perspectives that you can take when approaching that position and some of them are going to be necessarily more favorable to one side or another, right? Like you can say we need to do everything possible to avoid a war, but Russia is an oligarchical imperialist nation that will never stop and everything must be done to stop them and anything and everything. Because keep in mind, anything's Russia on the table. Russia is an oligarchical imperialist nation. No, no, no. I agree with you. <laughs> well, I'm not saying you disagree. I'm just saying that okay. anything can be done to prevent nuclear war includes sanctioning, cooing, whatever Russia. But- so if we're talking about the chess pieces laid out in the board here and we have like the ones Russia wants, the one the United States wants, the ones that Ukraine want, like 
everything's on the table to prevent nuclear war. My worry is that we're only kicking the can down the line. As long as Russia's like this, we're going to keep dealing with this problem. An old world empire trying to enforce its borders with actual annexation, the way that modern nations don't really do, that we might have to deal with this problem again in 10, 20, 30 years. My only concern is at what point in time does pulling the lever make the most sense? When When is it... When is it the best time to deal with the Russian question? And everything up until that <laughs> point is Russian biding your time. I know it sounds dramatic, right? But like they're playing a pretty heavy game here. They're threatening to invade a neighboring country, uh, you know, uh, bringing up World War Three prompts over nothing. Because as you and I agree, the threat of NATO invading Russia is non-existent. So at most you could say this is an extension of national paranoia, but then so was our invasion of Iraq. So I don't think that's a good justification. They're they're risking a lot off of very little, right? Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I agree with uh, a lot of that. I think that one of the reasons why um, I have the position I have and you have the position you have and why maybe you took issue with a lot of the stuff in my original video on it is because from my perspective, and I generally feel this way about international affairs, a, a lot of people, you know, they like World War II is their go-to example. And this is why history is fascinating and why it's really complex. But the lesson from World War II was like, you can't appease if somebody's unappeasable and if they're a monster and they're going to do terrible things and they're hell-bent on world domination, there is no other answer but like moral force in, re in reaction to it. So for genuinely defensive reasons going after, uh, you know, the evildoer, and that's the right thing. But I often think about, and I get why sometimes, you know, that's necessary, why, while sometimes, why sometimes, you know, a war can be done for, for moral reasons. I get that. But the example that I think people don't talk about nearly enough is the world war that came just before that, World War I. Because the crazy thing is the lesson of World War I was almost the exact opposite of the lesson of World War II. Because you had the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And then every, like all these countries had mutual defense treaties with all these other countries. And so when one country was dragged into the war, another four countries were dragged into the war. And then on the other side, another bunch of countries were dragged into the war. And next thing you know, you blinked and we were all in a world war. And so it's almost like, the lesson from World War One was like, look, it's probably better to mind your own business, don't have all these treaties, uh, look after your own uh, domestic politics, don't care as much about international issues, be non-interventionist, be hands-off, be isolationist. It's like that was the lesson of World War One, but then the lesson of World War Two was no, be interventionist. And so I think that um, I always see more shades of World War One than World War Two, even in dealing with this um, with the Russia situation and you're, you see more World War II of like, look, this guy's unappeasable. Uh, he's going to keep doing this unless he's shown that he can't do it. And so that's why you're inclined to, uh, to talk about it in the way that you do and why I'm inclined to talk about it in the way that I do. No, I, I understand that escalation um, in that respect. I don't know if it's perfectly analogous to World War I because there are really only like two meaningful political blocks in the situation, right? I mean, it wouldn't be like a cascade of different, like conflicting alliances. It's, you know, there's the, there's them and there's us. And I guess the world's gotten a little bit simpler in that respect, at least thanks to globalization. Um, but in, in terms of how like this would, this would go down, the problem that I have with the isolationist approach, I guess, is that sometimes examples of it being a good idea are used to justify examples of it being a bad idea. There are plenty of situations where America should have kept its hands to itself over the past century. Not going to deny that. But the Russia thing isn't a problem to me just because I think risking World War III over Eastern Ukraine is worth it. It's because if you believe that Russia won't stop, that Russia has no intention of stopping. And again, like I feel like the evidence really weighs in favor of that, given the fact that they've engaged in a number of proxy wars um, 
that they fund, you know, disinfo campaigns, that they promote uh, territories they've acquired, at least like four of them since the fall of the Soviet Union, um, and that they keep doing so with the thinnest justification on countries that have no chance whatsoever at invading Russia or meaningfully attacking them or threatening them in any way. I feel like the evidence is stacked very much in favor of them being the aggressor. And maybe like you let them have East Ukraine or whatever, as I guess horrible as that is, but if it keeps going, if it keeps happening, I asked you earlier what you would do if we did pull NATO back to its post-Cold War boundary and they just kept eating up countries. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they wouldn't have to do Belarus, of course, because of Lukashenko, Romania, Poland, Hungary. If they just kept doing this, you know, year after year, you hear about secessionist movements, about assassination attempts from radicals within their country. If it keeps ramping up and up and up, what do we do? It feels like we're forfeiting by stepping back. We're giving them the, the chicken coop. Yeah, my, my response to that was uh, as soon as they hit a NATO country, all bets are off. But I mean, there are hundreds mm -hmm. of millions of people before that. I know, but um, this is why I talked about, I think it's reasonable for those countries to want to arm themselves because uh, they should have their own ability to do self-defense. Look, I, you, you know what my instinct is on this. I think that uh, we shouldn't be the world police. We shouldn't be in the position to have to defend other countries Why because not? we don't even because we don't even really do that we don't even want to do that that's not the actual purpose of us doing what we but do you just overseas. said it's but, well, well the purpose is irrelevant the function is what matters and you just acknowledge that if they hit a nato country all bets are off so even in your example under your terms nato well, because is then, the then you have defends them then i think you have whether it's the nato countries or once they expand beyond that into europe at some point uh, if that were the case, then it would be obvious that he is in favor of world domination and you have to stop anybody who's in favor of world domination in the same way that you have to stop Hitler who's in favor of world domination. What about not so, world domination? Mm -hmm. What if he just wants to reestablish the Soviet Union borders? Yeah, that's that's the one that I'm talking about that's uh, more difficult because, I mean, but no, I mean, some of the post-Soviet states are now in NATO. You know, so cl one, close to mm -hmm. it then. Obviously, he's not going to get East Germany, but there are a dozen countries that he could devour uh, on the mm -hmm. way. Like, like, like we just tell all these countries, like, sorry, Russia's, Russia wants no. you to be open to their imperialism. We have to so go. So if that were to happen, I would, I mean, those countries should be armed to the teeth to prevent that. But yes, I'm not going to send some poor kid from Kentucky or Cleveland or Harlem to go fight and die for for that. I'm just not going to do it so, as president. So wait, hold on. We're not talking about boots on the mm -hmm. ground because we don't want direct engagement between the US and Russia. But so you're saying that Russia, so, so hypothetically, you're saying that mm -hmm. Russia potentially conquering a territory that encompasses hundreds of millions of people would not be a justified invocation of defensive warfare? Isn't humanitarian it, warfare it would, the goal? Well, it would absolutely be. I mean, they would they would be acting in an imperialist way. They would be taking in this scenario, they'd be taking land that's not theirs. Uh, the question is, when do we get involved because we think it's a threat to us? Or when do we get involved because we think he has domination goals? Why only beyond? Us? What's that? Why only us? Well, because I don't think I don't I don't think we should be the world police. I just don't agree with that. And we're I know not... you said before, like the functionality is all that matters. Who cares what like the purpose as to why we're doing it? The... But I actually think that stuff does matter. The proletariat generally. is international. And we're not being the world police here because world police implies that we're kind of putting our nose in affairs that aren't ours. These countries are begging for NATO assistance. They would be begging for our help. We wouldn't we wouldn't show up there as like the moral authority, so the high horse when, Americans. When would you, when we would, would be you do the it allies. Then? When would you do it? When when would you send the troops? I'd say well right at now. At what point? At what point would it be like, you know what, this has gone too far. We have to send the troops. If we retreat NATO, we've already lost. We keep NATO's borders. We bring Ukraine into the fold after this is done, depending on how it settles, we'll have to see. Um we we keep that line and we starve Russia out. Um, we make it so untenable for them to even pretend to be an imperialist power that they have to change their ways. But if we retreat, we've already lost that because then, at least in the propaganda war, uh, us retreating NATO, but then sending troops in to defend the hundreds of millions we abandoned would be, well, it would be politically complicated at least.
it would be very difficult to manage, I think. So when, but when, when would you actually do boots on the ground for like a, a war, a suit in a hypothetical where he keeps going beyond Eastern Ukraine, beyond all of Ukraine, you know, tries to reestablish the old Soviet Union at, at what, which point, which country, which line are you like, well, Poland, gotta do it. Poland, Romania and Slovenia are all NATO members. So if they cross mm -hmm. that line, then that's the line that so, we drew. So your, right? so your line is what I said before too, just the, the NATO countries, basically, as soon as he goes into the NATO countries, all bets are off. But you want to retreat NATO. You want to give him an extra dozen countries to play with before running up against our borders. I think we should expand I, NATO. I want Russia to be NATO. I don't know. Why not? Fuck him. Um, Oh, but... I genuinely, I, I honestly, Vosh, after uh, after having this conversation, I don't know where I would draw the line, and I don't know. Look, it's possible that doing some of the the um, concessions and some of the things that Russia says they want, it's possible if we agree to it that it genuinely would squash the beef. I I truly believe that. I know you don't believe that. I truly believe that. But it's also possible it doesn't. <laughs> and if it doesn't, then yeah, you look kind of fucking stupid. If you pull, if you pull, you know, NATO back to where it was it's in not say 1992, and, and what's that? It's not a spite thing, and neither of us can see the future. I just, I'm interested in your perspective on this. We, uh, you know, we agree on a lot. We don't run in perfectly identical circles. There are people who are running around right now, you know, completely justifying everything Russia does. Um, you know, like uh, Ukrainian aggression must be stopped. Yeah, blah blah blah. Um, the language that you used trended close to that at some points ukraine being a fake state though i think i know what you meant when you said that like a post-soviet union immediate you know yeah, line in, in the, sand the borders were drawn in the 1990s that's what i mean I, I think it existed as a as a as a product the ussr but i were, were the borders changed after the soviet union fell or uh... i don't know all, all i know is um the borders were drawn in the early 1990s and obviously part of it is ethnic Ukrainians and then part of it is more ethnic Russians. That's all I meant by that. Borders are all artificial, of course. I'm just not much of an isolationist. When, uh, like, people being, people dying in Ukraine are people dying home, home's earth. I just, I, 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 I worry, obviously nuclear war must be averted, but I, I, I think we, we have to, we have to approach this situation with an attitude of unimaginable contempt towards Russia, because the most charitable interpretation of what's taking place, even from your perspective, is they are manufacturing a justification for invasion based on um, like uh, false concerns over NATO aggression on Russia's border. I think both country, both actors, the West and Russia, I think they both think they're acting defensively when in reality to differing degrees they're both actually acting offensively but ukraine is literally acting defensively no i understand that but i'm not even just talking about ukraine i'm talking about everything post soviet union breakup from then all the way until now both what russia did in georgia and ukraine and crimea and um what the u.s did with further nato expansion i think that every step of the way on the side of the US and Russia, they genuinely thought we are acting defensively, but in reality, both sides were actually acting offensively. And so, you know, I you can see how we got to this terrible point because if everybody's, and you brought this up earlier, it's like, that is the go-to move of authoritarians. That is the go-to move of imperialists. Is like you scream and, and, and you, play the victim as you actually act offensively and aggressively. And we I think there's been a lot of that happening on both sides of this to different degrees. do that though. NATO, the, no, no, the no, countries I'm, that are in NATO. I'm talking about with the NATO expand. I'm not, first of all, I'm not saying they're perfectly analogous. I'm just saying that and there are differing degrees here, but yeah, NATO expansion towards Russia's border was in effect something that the, the US thought was defensive and perhaps NATO thought it was defensive, but it is offensive. The, it's the, like they want to make sure that Russia doesn't have their sphere of influence and they want it to go back and, you know, rehash the Cold War arguments. The, it's similar to like the Treaty of Versailles after World War II, where it was very punitive towards uh, towards Germany. I don't and, I don't like the equivocacy here because, first of all, the Treaty of Versailles happened to Germany, whereas NATO expansion is happening to sovereign nations that request to be part of NATO. So by 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 implying that 
the Treaty of Versailles, which was a punitive, you know, attack on Germany, is comparable to sovereign nations Russia claims holdover choosing to be with NATO, suggests to me, I don't like this equivocacy. Obviously, Russia and America are both acting in their geopolitical interests, but the difference is the countries that are in NATO want NATO there. Obviously, there are some complexities historically, but in terms of, you know, Estonia, Latvia, what have you, you know, Ukraine now, Poland, these countries want us there. What Russia does, they're also acting in their geopolitical interest, but that's what all countries are doing all the time. The difference is we do it because our superior economic block and our relative stability affords them protection and economic resources, and Russia just invades countries that are weaker than it. There's, I, I think what if there just wasn't a NATO, though, going back to the beginning, or at least, or at least not expanding post the original like 1940s countries, which was a very limited number of countries? What it like... It, imagine we lived in a world where that was the case. Ru what, NATO what isn't happened? the issue here. Russia is the no, issue. I'm just ask, I'm asking you a question. I'm not. I'm not implying anything beyond the question. I'm curious if NATO was never expanded, like it was in the 1990s and the early 2000s. If it just stayed in the original, the original 1940s countries, which was not many countries at all. I don't know if it was 13 countries or 20 countries or whatever it was. I okay. think Russia would have so, done exactly what it did anyway, because Russia very clearly is not acting out out of see, a perceived fear of NATO. There, you, you, you are buying the propaganda line if you sincerely believe them when they say that, ah, yes, our invasions of these adjacent neighboring countries are totally because NATO expansion is happening. This is, th this is literally... Uh, George Bush really thought invading Iraq would prevent another 9-11. You would never give water to this kind of behavior if it was coming from Americans or American officials. Do not justify Russia's imperialism by linking it to this. Not now, it's true that if not, it, it, not it, 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 it is, though, even it's if you're not saying... trying to explain where, it com where you, some of this comes You're giving from. it a more legitimate explanation than it deserves. The explanation is that but they're looking not, for an excuse to expand gosh. their geopolitical sphere of influence, not it's not a it's not a coincidence that the Crimea thing and the Georgia thing lined up perfectly with NATO expansion. Would, would, and with would, an would the invasion of, that's not a coincidence. Would the invasion of Iraq happened uh, without 9/11? Is it a coincidence Probably. that they happened one right after the other? They used it as the excuse. I get what you're saying. Russia used this as the excuse, but I think that I don't think I think that there is to an extent it's reasonable from their perspective to to view it that way invade i don't georgia think... because nato expanded on their other front to chechnya no it's, false it's flag reason... no so so look, i just want to be clear you think you the entire narrative but you're do you think the entire now. narrative about nato expand like you think they don't even believe that the west is a threat and nato's a threat Oh, we're, oh we're a threat, but not because of NATO expansion. The threat with NATO expansion isn't that we'll invade Russia. It's that we're cutting off territory that they could otherwise invade themselves. We're partitioning up territory. So then you don't, you don't think they think they're a threat. You think that they know that NATO's acting defensively, but they're acting offensively. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, you view them as like twisting their evil mustache and be like, whoa, no, no, we will no, now no. do... They're just things. acting. And it's like, no, they they're think just they're acting defensively. Acting in their geopolitical interest. Wait, I'm sorry. Did you do you think Bush was acting defensively when he invaded Iraq? Do you think of he course thought not, that? But I don't think wait, I don't wait, think... wait, wait, wait. Do you think he thought that? Or do you think there were other interests that he had and he could use 9-11 as a convenient excuse to continue now, his father's legacy? It's possible that they bought some of the defensive bullshit of it. Yeah. Of, not, of 9 11 the Saudi linked so do you think he was twirling his evil mustache? I've seen how you talk about like the invasion of Iraq, by the way. Well, you are not you are not sitting there saying, well, you know, if it weren't for 9-11, they probably wouldn't have. And 9-11, you know, there was a link. And if only 9-11 had like, I know that you know that I geopolitics think they, isn't some that of simple. The bull, some you're right. Some of the bullshit they believe. Some of it is they're looking for the excuse anyway, but that's the same claim I'm making about Russia, is that some of it they believe, and then some of it is just a convenient excuse. You acknowledged I, earlier I in this debate that NATO in both... can't invade Russia. We can't invade a nuclear no, power. No, I, I, I don't think they're going to invade them. I think it, it's factual to say, even under a situation where they expanded right to their border in every respect, that they're not going to invade them. But I think that from, that from their perspective, they might think they actually will do that. I don't think that's a crazy claim. Just like I think some of the people in the U.S. The government leading up to the attack on Iraq really thought like 
no, I, I buy some of this bullshit. I but buy they, some of this stuff, the, the, the justification, they, the rationalization. They didn't. The Colin Powell was instructed to lie to the United Nations. They knew they were lying. They were, he was instructed, Colin Powell had moral obligations, or, or sorry, moral objections to the line that he was told to give the UN. He had to be instructed to do so. And because he was a simpering bitch boy, he did it. <laughs> they they knew they were lying they lied to the american people and you've said they've lied to the american people they Don't... definitely lied to the american people in the sense that the things they were saying were factually false but going inside their minds and going back then did they all think they're twisting their evil mustaches and being like no, they, we're gonna they do this invasion or, lied. look i'm trying i'm trying to to think this out in real time with you i think that it probably both things are true like to some extent some of the people thought no, this is really defensive. And some people thought, well, we're just kind of using this as an excuse. And I think it works the same way on the Russian side. If, I, think it, I think it's analogous on both sides. Do you, you disagree with that? If, I, I, I would be shocked if anyone with any semblance of power in Russia sincerely believed that NATO was going to invade Russia. If, if, if you not, don't, not even invasion, but that they're a threat. That they're a threat they're in a any threat sense. And, economically, totally destroying. You oh, know, eco stuff oh like economically, that. undeniably, sure. But... That's the game, baby. Russia's in a different trade block. That's kind of their fault. The West made an effort to integrate them into our trade block after the Cold War ended, and they didn't. That is true, yes. Yeah. It, it, with with regards to this, like, if you're not... It, I, I've seen you talk about the Iraq War. I know you don't go like, well, you know, I don't think they were evil twiddling their mustaches. I think some of them probably legitimately did believe. We know that nation states will lie and use any justification they can get away with to extend their political influence to justify geopolitical grabs and as long as the west exists there will always be an excuse for russia listen to how they talk to ukraine it's not just nato expansion it's everything trade relations troops being anywhere near the border they don't like nato existing at all of course but th there will always be an excuse pull nato back all the way to italy and germany and they'll talk about how nato's existence at all is an issue. Get rid of NATO and they'll talk about how preferential Western trading blocks are starving out their people. And that's the reason why they need to secure this pipeline, this river. There's always going to be an excuse. And given how weak their excuses have been up to this point, I shudder at how flimsy they'll be if we actually did accede to some of their demands and force them to come up with more creative justifications. Yeah. So why not, if you're convinced that, you know, basically, look, they're bad actors, they don't even believe a word of what they say. Uh, in terms of like, they think NATO's a threat, they think the West's a threat, it's all aggression, and that's the end of the conversation. If that's the case, uh, then I don't see why not, why we wouldn't only just arm the people in the region and say, good luck to you. <laughs> because again, my instinct is like, I just don't, I don't wanna get, I don't wanna get involved in anything that we don't absolutely have to get involved in to protect our own country. Now, I agree with you that at a certain point, if they expand past a certain point and it's clear that there's world domination goals, I don't think that's gonna happen. But if that were to happen, yes, then of course, in the same way with World War II, you have to get involved in the same way. But um, I don't, I think the, the thing in your commentary that I disagree with when I watched your initial video on the Ukraine-Russia situation, you had this one line where you were like, look, any take any takeaway from this other than Russia bad is uh, is wrong, <laughs> and my response to that is you're you're half right. Yes, Russia bad, but also U.S. bad, and we need like we need a way out of this that involves diplomacy and negotiation, which which avoids uh, a hot war or World War Three, and I think that it should be all hands on deck for that purpose at the moment. And I, I, I agree go ahead. we need to prevent that. I don't think the United States has done, to my knowledge, anything wrong in this situation. The U.S. bad even going generally. Back to, even going back to the breakup of the Soviet Union and, and everything that followed post that, the harsh neoliberalism imposed from oh, the outside. Oh, okay. Well, hold, hold, hold on. I'm, go ahead. If, if, we're, if we're accounting for all of modern history, then yes, U.S. very bad. I'm just talking about this situation. You can talk about the predicating circumstances leading up to it, but I don't think, like... Neoliberalism, neoliberalism's harsh consequences are a justification for 30 years later, like the invasion of Ukraine. So in, in the isolated incident, if we're to talk about all of history accounted for, then every group ever bad, right? I mean, we have to isolate the conversation here in this situation. And, and, and to that extent, right, I guess an issue I have is it feels like it feels like sometimes your sincere isolationist tendencies are invoked. Not interventionist, not isolationist. Sorry oh, sorry, uh, isolationist, my bad. Yeah, thank you, I misspoke. Your sincere isolationist tendencies are invoked alongside 
the justifications that Russia uses to be very much not isolationist. Because it's possible to be fully isolationist, but also to say, like, fuck Russia, fuck what they're doing, they're lying for excuse, you know, whatever, fuck them, something needs to be done, but I'm not doing it. That's a thing an isolationist can say. But you're saying I'm an isolationist and also holding water for, I think, a lot of ideas that are favorable to their edge in this geopolitical conflict, which leads me to wonder, is the isolationism just th is 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 the is the belief that russia has its excuses and we should pull back a way of feeding the isolationism or is the isolationism a way of feeding the positions that seem to geopolitically favor russia you you know what i mean like which which of these is the dominant tendency or are they codependent equal uh it effectively uh you know weighted the same in terms of um how they influence your your policy making in the video where I talked about this that you disagreed with. Sorry, non-interventionist. I sorry, I, if I misspoke a bunch of times there, it's because my brain is foggy. I've, a non-interventionist, isolationist, the term you prefer. I meant that one. Sorry. In the video that I originally did on this that you took issue with, the instinct to give the their side of the story as well is born out of the fact that the media uh, steadfastly refuses to do that. You don't hear any conversation about the expansion of NATO or they don't even list the things that Russia has openly put on the table as like, here's the things that we would like you to agree to. And then, you know, we can make some sort of a deal around these things. So I view that as a matter of like journalistic necessity to bring that up. Not that I am a journalist because I'm not, I'm an asshole with an opinion and a microphone, but that's where that comes from. And in terms of the non-interventionist versus isolationist thing, the reason why uh, I, I accept the label non-interventionist proudly versus isolationist is because isolationist, I feel like has a, a pejorative connotation to it. And also it almost sounds like it has some, uh, you know, baggage with it along the lines of like trade. Like I also want to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world in terms of economic activity, which I don't agree with. Um, so non-interventionist, the, the whole idea behind my non-interventionism is that it, I feel like in order to act on the global stage, if you're a sovereign country, you need to have some sort of standard by which you act. And the, the most reasonable position that I could come up with when it comes to when's it uh, justifiable to use force is only for imminent self-defense. That's the thing that I feel like is, it's when it's okay, not even just uh, globally and, and internationally, but uh, even in your personal life, like the only time I think force is moral is when it's for imminent self-defense. And so- You can defend yeah, other people too though. In US well, self-defense well, law, you can extend that to kill a person who's threatening another. Well, yeah, so I, uh, that's not the way I think about it. And that's why, yes, oftentimes, you're right. My non-interventionist instinct absolutely comes out in almost every segment I do on, on foreign policy. And almost any, even when we cover, like even in the whole like, the punch a Nazi debate back in the day where it was like some guy, some Antifa dude ran up and decked Richard Spencer. I took a super unpopular position on the left and I was like, look, he's a piece of shit. I hate him. He's wrong about everything. He's evil. He's racist, all this stuff. But yeah, I wouldn't run up and hit him like that because I think that I don't want to use the same tactics as the enemy and become the devil that I'm trying to avoid. So yes, when I look at the global situation and the way the United States act and, and you know, the way in which uh, we're brazenly imperialist in many respects. That leads me back to my position of, look, self-defense is the only uh, reason I would use violence against you know, a threat of imminent attack. And I also see that the United States just genuinely, even though it pretends like it's the world police and they, we care about humanitarianism and, and how people are doing worldwide, I mean, that's so easily and, and it's easily debunkable. I mean, look at our top allies are like Saudi Arabia and Israel. Israel's a... a, a Freaking theocracy at doing apartheid, and you have Saudi Arabia, which is a government that beheads people in the public square for, you know, drug smuggling and and apostasy and all sorts of stuff. We do good so, things sometimes too, like defend sovereign no, we against absolutely. invasion. I, I don't. I just think wish, we should have that role. I, look, we'll I, I just here. My, I'll, only, I'll my only, I, my only, my only. I just want to say, my only wish. I don't think there's anything wrong with telling Russia's side of the story. I wish you told Ukraine's because in Ukraine's story, we are unambiguously not the devil. We are the 
potential for salvation. And ultimately, it's their country on the brink of being invaded. They're being talked about in this conversation, a buffer state, a pawn, oh, only East Ukraine, whatever. But a lot of people live there. And at the end of the day, they want us to protect them from Russia. We can't put troops on the ground there directly because that would be very risky for a number of reasons. But it 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 just it feels like so much of the way you talk about this is deferential to the greater power as long as the greater power isn't America. On America, it's hands off, non interventionist, no, right? But, but okay, Russia. But let me be clear. Let me be clear. The invasion of Georgia was wrong, terrible, evil, a violation of international law, uh, punishable under international law. Uh, Vladimir Putin is a criminal as a result of that. The exact same thing is the case for Crimea. The exact same thing is the case with an invasion of Ukraine if that happens now. Even though I'm giving all of what I think are the nuances and the complexities and, and the mitigating factors in here, that doesn't deflect one bit from the ironclad reality that Ukraine is a sovereign nation that under no circumstances it should be invaded. So that, look, that's one of those things that is so obvious that I didn't think I would have to spell it out so clearly because I would assume that you would understand since we've had many conversations and we've both acted in good faith that you would understand that it's not like I'm, the reason I'm not saying that is because I secretly in a sinister way agree with Russia invading countries and jacking part of them. No, it's just one of those things that's so obvious that I thought it doesn't even need bearing repeating. I, I don't think it's your silence is indicative of the worst position you have on the issue, but I think the information we choose to provide is important. And it is undeniable that in your video, Ukraine was a buffer state with significant portions of ethnically Russian people who wouldn't be that unamenable to a True. Russian invasion. We should not get ourselves involved. And also NATO and US bad. And while there and are, Russia bad. And Russia well, bad. Well, well, all I, the above. <laughs> well, I did watch the video here, and the issue is that it's a video in which Russia's going... The situation is Russia invading Ukraine, so it seems like in terms of the weight given to different pieces of information, you can talk about the geopolitics that lead to it, of course, what practically can or can we not do, but the end, the impression should, I think, be one which is ultimately condemnation of Russia, um, you know, solidarity with Ukraine, and taking a support for actions which either reduce the likelihood of this invasion or reduce the likelihood of future ones. And that's not the impression that I got, not because you have the opposite opinions necessarily, but because of what you chose to provide. And it, it does create an impression, right? Uh, what, what we choose to say, what info we provide, right? Well, I mean, look, I just, I think, I don't want to go through your videos and like nitpick things you've said on foreign policy that I disagree with and imply that this might mean you have some sort of unfair bias towards the State Department, as you, you, you know, you brought up <laughs> earlier. And I wouldn't expect you to do the same thing when it comes to, you know, my stuff on, on issues like this as well. So, I mean, you know, we've had this conversation before vis-a-vis -vis Jimmy Dore, how like, Perhaps my, my, one of my flaws is that I'm almost, if I know somebody and I know they're acting in good faith, perhaps I'm almost too deferential uh, to their intentions and whatnot. But this is clearly not a position that other people hold. And if that was the impression that you got from my video, fair enough. But at the same time, uh, I would hope that when you hear me say in real time now that it's not just NATO bad, US bad, Ukraine buffer state. It's also, yeah, Russia bad. It's obvious you don't invade sovereign nations. So I hope that hearing that in real time now, you would say, oh, okay, well, I understand where you were coming from, even if I don't necessarily agree. But as we went through previously, when I asked you, what would you do in this situation or that situation? The only disagreement we appear to really have is you would unleash perhaps a harsher sanctions package earlier than I would. But outside yeah, of that, we don't have too many disagreements. I guess the other disagreement would be, I don't think it's crazy to think that meeting some of those demands that Russia laid out um, is appeasement. I think it is possible that if you meet some of those demands, um, it actually would genuinely get us closer to peace and, and de-escalate the tensions. But I know you hearing that, you think, well, I'm just being naive and you know, he's an authoritarian, he's unappeasable. Point taken, I just think that it's a, uh, I, I don't think he's necessarily uh, a Hitler type character who has global 
uh, dominance ambitions. I don't even think he, I think he realized he can't even take over all the former Soviet Union. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll end there and let you take over. No, no, I feel like we've discussed the essentials here. Um, it was never my intention to um, uh, just snipe bits of video uh, to, to talk with you about. It is it, it is uh, an impression that I got. Obviously, we um, we uh, uh, have some different priorities when it comes to geopolitics and some, it feels, sincere disagreements um, outside not just of what we believe is good or bad, but what we think can be done. Um, I, uh, yeah. Obviously, there's no way to put our um, our beliefs to the test. I think it's very unlikely that NATO gets pulled back, so we will not get to see if that would meaningfully contribute to peace in the region. I have no doubt that antagonism will continue uh, throughout my life, no matter where NATO is, certainly if it's kept at its current borders. Um, and I guess we'll just have to see how that gets dealt with. Hopefully, it never escalates to World War III. Anyway, I I do sincerely appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Um, I have been watching you for far longer than I have been doing any political content online. And uh, I don't think there's anybody who I agree with um, in my totality. So it's always good to be able to have conversations with them when there are schisms as such. Yeah, listen, I don't, um, everybody knows this. I, I don't, I'm a very introverted person. I don't uh, do too many collaborations or uh, interviews with other people. I mean, we have Crystal Kyle friends, but she books everything. I just talk to the people when, you know, we're actually on air and whatnot, but uh, I don't usually do a lot of, uh, a lot of things outside of just staying in my lane and doing my show and stuff. But yeah, I mean, the reason why I come on here and I talk to you uh, about this is because uh, I like your content. I mean, look, granted, you, you we both know we don't agree on everything well, usually what i do is i won't click on the videos where i feel like we i am a pawn of the state department uh yeah it's there there is some disagreement there i do get a lot of money from the cia <laughs> and i i get very much money from russia mother russia um but yeah like i i like your stuff i i always watch the things a lot of things catch my eye you're in my regular rotation of stuff that i listen to so yeah i mean i try my best and i fa i failed at this from time to time but i really do try my best when I'm talking about other people um, in the left space, I try not to um, go after them or burn bridges or, or, or create ill will. And I know you used to have a thing. What'd you call? What'd you call it? The cum pledge or something? <laughs> yes. Uh, no. <laughs> well, you are. You are like the. Uh, it should have been the Kalinsky pledge. You're like the. You're. You are. You are like the alchemical distillation of that. Um, of of that pledge you you and, honor it with remarkable um it, you know consistency and and how did it go what was the what was the thing oh yeah it was it was like it come see you don't argue with lefties online um get a lot of sleep don't wait chat i don't remember wait what was the come well, oh god it's been a while i've been arguing with so many people it's uh <laughs> it's oh wait, it's 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 don't get mad online uh uh, 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 get enough sleep. What was the What was the third one? Chat. Don't argue with other leftists. Don't argue with other leftists. That was it. Yes. Yes. There yeah. You so I, you know, I try. I I try to kind of abide by that as much as possible. I mean, every now and then you can, and you sort of have to deviate from it a little bit. But as much as I possibly can, I try to just cover the news and and politics and information as as I see it, and then also give my opinion. But usually, when I'm going after people. It's the Ben Shapiro types, it's the, the right wingers, or it's politicians. So yeah, I try to abide by that as much as possible because I do think it's important. And maybe hopefully me and you, uh, not just having a conversation like we did last time where it was almost all agreement, but having a conversation now where we disagree. I hope that what people could take away from this is that look, even though we have disagreements, we'll continue to have disagreements from time to time. There's a difference between disagreeing with somebody who you disagree with on 100% of things or, disagreeing with somebody who's genuinely a bad actor because they're corrupt or whatever versus somebody who's broadly in the tent that you have a disagreement with, you know? And uh, I think that it's, in, it's important to treat people who are gen generally in the same tent, uh, it, treat the conversations with the nuance and complexities that, that it deserves. And so, you know, I'm actually happy that we have this conversation. I know we still won't see 100% eye to eye on it, but uh, I appreciate you hearing me out. I have always and will always have um a lot of respect for you. I appreciate you taking the time, especially on your birthday. Um, 
I definitely value left unity a lot less than you, but uh, some people, <laughs> some people uh, are more worth uh, keeping on good terms with than others. Thank you very much. For th I meant you when I said that. I didn't mean to Thanks, man. be ambiguous. I appreciate that. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for taking the time. Go eat um, birthday cake if you like cake. Some people don't like cake. <laughs> Uh, I will probably, I don't think I have any fucking food in my house, so I don't know Get what I'm going to do, but I'll figure it out. Yeah, well, I'm too, I'm too lazy to go somewhere and do that. Kyle. So I'll probably just watch TV and eat whatever garbage is sitting around me. Get a so. Okay, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is, you know, maybe it's cake, good garbage. All right, have a wonderful day. Thanks, man. You too. Be well. I have no doubt there are people here who wish that I had been more antagonistic. Um, I'm... Very happy with the way in which I delivered my points, and I have no corrections for myself. Uh, anyone who, uh, yeah, I, I feel, I feel like the 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 issue has been discussed. Um, the the different perspectives have been aired, and though I cannot magically change the minds of everyone else, I, 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 I feel as though um, I've done a good job advocating for what I believe in. Finley, if sanctions are to be put against Russia, I think they should be prioritized against oligarchs first. I'm not that well read on how sanctions tend to be applied, but I feel like given Russia's very um, uh, um, bimodal income distribution, it might be possible to be more selective with the targeting. Is that possible? Well, if a Russian citizen owns um, property in the U.S., they're probably doing okay, right? You're probably not starving the average Russian by freezing the assets of people who have, like, a vacation house in the United States or a penthouse apartment in Manhattan. Just a guess of mine. Um, looking through the newest comments in Kyle's video, there are people saying Vosh is a State Department asset. There are always going to be people who run that line. Um, I do, For what it's worth, implications aside, I do not think that Russia... Sorry, I don't think that Kyle is like a Russian state asset. I think that Kyle is on good terms with people who basically are, though. Obviously, the gray, the gray zone cucks, also known as the cuck zone, also known as the everything they claim to hate in the rest of the Western left, also known as the bitch boys, also known as the chemical weapon sniffers, also known as the... I don't know, they're just kind of dumb. It's a long name. Yeah, Russian names tend to be like that. Uh, this is their official Putin granted name. He knighted them. Uh, yeah, just open the window. Um, there are types that are. There are going to be people who will dismiss anything that I have to say because it comes off as pro-American and because I used harsh language with Russia. But I want to be clear about something, okay? I am an anarchist. Nation states are bad. They are forms of political organization that have caused more harm and destruction than literally anything else in all of human history. Every modern, bad, terrible thing that happens is a product in some way or another of the geopolitical relations that nation states create. There's no getting around that. Now, America, being the biggest and the baddest of the existing countries on Earth and of any country to have ever existed, uh, does a lot of bad. Russia is much weaker than us. And... In so doing, probably does a lot less bad. Proportional to Russia's size and strength, they probably do more bad. This is like a who's worse, you know? A uh, faltering healthcare system that kills 10 extra people through like poor regulation every year, or a serial killer who kills nine. There are degrees of heinousness you have to factor in. The second person gets the chair, the first people probably don't. They probably get, you know, regulation. Um, there are complexities to be gone about there. Uh, one fact, however, remains undeniable, and it is that we live in a world which is shaped by the political relationships of the post-Cold War era. We live in a world of explicit decolonization and implicit neocolonization. Or to put it another way, annexing territory is not something that happens anymore. The fact that a country with nukes feels like they can get away with that is very very scary for a lot of reasons. Nowadays, when America does imperialism, it's either us invading a country to bring democracy, which again, not a defense. We didn't bring democracy. We killed a lot of innocent people in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it's not done through the premise or the pretense of 
annexing territory or just conquering our neighbors, or in that case, not our neighbors. Uh, it's done usually to foment geopolitical power in the area and bolster the power of our allies. Israel benefits from our occupation in the Middle East because by proxy it helps that, you know, it's complicated. It's very, very complicated, but it's usually not just let's take this territory uh, because that's a very old antiquated way of engaging in imperialism. And there are reasons why neocolonialism are in many is in many cases better than colonialism. Or to put it another way, if you ask the average Ukrainian citizen whether they would rather A, uh, have Russian foreign investors and venture capitalists uh, put money into their country, or B, be invaded by Russia, they would probably choose A, because the former uh, is a little less scary, especially when some people have nukes. It's a little bit less frightening. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going through all of this, and the reason why I'm doing so is because I want you guys to understand, this isn't about America being good. America sucks. It's not about NATO being good. NATO doesn't exist because Western Europe and America want to protect Ukraine. NATO exists because they want to protect themselves, because forming a web of political and military alliances makes your country more safe. If America could benefit from damning the rest of the world to hell, it would do so. If that, if that, if it was in the geopolitical interest of the United States to just disappear the rest of the earth and just live alone as a singular nation, they would do so. Which is one of the reasons why it's so essential that you build a global national framework it, which fosters codependence. This is why mutual trade blocks are essential. This is one of the reasons why it's very important that countries trade with each other and why I am not a protectionist. The more countries trade with each other, the more disastrous it would be for those trade relationships to be interrupted by, say, for example, warfare. This is the reason why there's not going to be any boots on the ground conflict between China and America. That would collapse both of our economies in like two seconds. You guys know that, right? Not to mention China holds a lot of U.S. debt, which means that they literally hold U.S. dollars, like hundreds of billions, trillions of U.S. dollars, the actual U.S. dollars. So what happens to China and the value of the debts they hold from us if the U.S. dollar collapses because of war. Huh? See, mutual economic codependence, I guess mutual and codependence is a bit of a, a redundancy there, but codependence economically is really, 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 really important at preventing war. You want the consequences of war to be so bad that you lose even if you win. That's the goal. You want the consequences to your economy to be so devastating that no military victory could ever outpace them. Ever. That is the goal. Now, this is one of the reasons why uh, NATO exists, and it's one of the reasons why uh, 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 Russia is dangerous. See, Russia is engaging in imperialism right now the old-fashioned way, not through trade relations. And the problem with that and the problem with Russia being so dangerous while also having such a small proportional economy is that it's really difficult to form that trade relationship with Russia. Russia doesn't have this big booming economy full of middle class people that will all go to shit if they ever declare war on another like West allied country. You guys understand what I mean? Russia's inability to be a part of our broader trade bloc means that they're less susceptible to the strategies that we use to maintain peace. Yeah, China does neocolonialism, and they do annex territory, don't get me wrong, but I don't think they do it in the same way, and I don't think they do it in a way which steps on the toes of the West. Uh, they do with their neocolonialism. Their traditional colonialism, they do it in ways that don't step on the toes of the West, because again, trade relationships, blah de blah de blah um, With the Russian situation, I'm just frightened because it seems like they have nothing to lose. It's There isn't this big, you know well-developed uh, middle class in Russia for whom the economy would collapse if they lost like trade relations with the United States. They should have, ad have adopted a Jucha Putinist ideology, you see. Uh, they are not self-reliant, but they're, they're just, it's, it's not part of the same block, you know? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's important to, to be able to overcome that. No, nothing that I'm saying right now, nothing at all, 
that I'm saying right now is a defense of the United States of America. This is just a simple read of the way the world works right now and the systems that we use to disincentivize warfare between major countries. Especially given the fact that Russia is a nuclear power, it is in fact the second largest nuclear power in terms of how many actual nuclear weapons they have. Very, very important that they get along with the rest of the world. Do you guys understand? This is why it's so important that Russia fall in line. It is not enough that they act peaceful. They need to make themselves vulnerable to the systems by which we promote peace. And I don't care how powerful they are as long as they exist within those systems. They can fall in line and be at the front of that line for all the fuck I care, all right? I don't give a shit. It's not like America's cool, actually. But they need to be in the line because these systems are how we prevent warfare. And they do have Danuks. Hold on. Vosh is factually wrong here. Russia projects its power through trade relations as well. It had trade relations with Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, other former states. I'm not literally saying they don't trade with other countries. If you want to take a look at the total like export import, like, uh, you know, metrics for Russia compared to the fucking United States, you're free to. I'm not saying they literally have a completely walled off economy, but that's not the mechanism by which they also notice how the countries that Russia trades with are also the countries within beating range. Isn't that interesting? Almost as though it uses its disproportionately strong military uh, to compel allegiance from non-nuclear powers in its periphery in order to maintain a trade block. The United States doesn't have to use its military all the time to do that. We have enough money, we can just buy them out. Uh, but the Soviet Union, they need to resort to other methods. Keep in mind that I am simplifying this a little bit, but I think what I'm saying right now is a good read of the situation broadly. If you want to learn more about it, you're free to get an entire master's degree <laughs> in foreign relations, um, because it's not like I know all the details of this shit. But anyway, just to be clear, that's what I mean by Russia needs to fall in line. Do you guys understand that? I just want you guys to understand that. It's not about them being subservient to the US. It's about them aligning themselves with systems that prevent countries with nuclear weapons from firing at each other, which would be good. Apparently the US felt like it couldn't buy out Iraq or Afghanistan. That wasn't why we were in Iraq and Afghanistan. Artemy, how are we doing? Are we feeling, uh, are we feeling agitated because you're locked in here in the studio? Because you wouldn't stop bullying Pigeon because she wouldn't stop screaming because Furman was too busy in the studio? How do you feel about geopolitics? Are you a fan of Russia? Are you an American fascist or a Russian fascist?